Okay, that's it for this video. I know, quick, wasn't it? But Karen S. will be taking over, and she'll be very quiet in her next video. Quiet? Karen S. is quiet? Decomfoted, man. Why did you not tell me about this? I'm gonna get that bitch to speak the fuck up. Karen S., you listen up. Turn off that motherfucking mute button. Oh, hi there, fellow YouTubers. This is Karen S., and I was having a few technical difficulties, but I think I have them resolved now. <clears throat> um... This is a continuation of my collaboration with the one and only Deconverted Man, putting the fallacy counting machine to the test in the recent Matt Dillahunty side Tenberg and Kate debate as published by The Thinking Atheist. This video will be a fallacy count of size cross-examination of Matt, which starts at timestamp 37. In order to keep this segment as short as possible, I'm going to use as much text as possible and only expound on certain points when necessary. It will also be noted who is being tagged for fallacy, as it will not always be Psy. And with that, let's rev up the fallacy machine and push the logic pedal to the metal. I'd like to start off with this question for you, Matt. When you said this... From the standpoint of objective reality, the belief that there is a God is a delusion. Do you still believe that? Yes. How do you know anything to be objectively real? How do I know? Any what do you mean by no? Well, the thing is, you made the claim that according to objective reality, belief in God is a delusion. Yes, I'm stating what my belief is, right. not reality. But you said according to objective reality. Yes, I believe it's objective. Okay, so what, how do you know anything to be objectively real when you've admitted you could be a brain in a vat? <laughs> what do you mean by no? Do you mean how am I aware of... Right, how are, you, how are you aware of objective reality? I'm, I'm aware of reality through my senses. But that's not what I asked you. I asked you how you're aware of what is objectively real. Not what you perceive to be real. So, when I use the term objectively in this context, I'm, I'm using it in the sense of not subjective or not contingent upon any one mind within the scope of reality. For example, I'm convinced that I'm in a room with other people right now, and if they are, agree with me that I'm in a room with them, then we can then work together to investigate reality. Right, but the, the fact is you've admitted you could be a brain in a fat. I haven't admitted that I can be. I haven't I've you could admitted be. that I cannot prove that I'm not. That's right. So, and therefore, it follows that you could be. Well, it doesn't follow that you could be. This claim by Sai reminds me of how he denies the antecedent in his familiar question, could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Sai is attempting to confuse the direction of a conditional with a biconditional proposition, which is the word could, because he's not considering the possibility of the inference condition that Matt Matt could not be a brain in a vat. Matt tries to straighten him out on this hypothetical throughout the debate, but Sai will not be moved because it seems the centerpiece of his debate strategy is attacking the straw man he has created of Matt as the brain in the vat. The fact that something hasn't been proved That's to not be what false I'm saying. does not mean that it's possible or true. Okay, so you trust your senses and reasoning in order to determine what is real in your reality, right? Yes. On what basis do you trust your sense and reasoning? On their continued reliability at producing effective results. Okay, now when you... <laughs> no, see, now well, the thing no, is... Hang on, let him ask the, the thing that... <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me that you don't see the folly of that answer. Because the thing is, he said, on their continued reliability. How does Matt know whether they've been reliable in the past? How does Matt know they're reliable now? How does Matt know that they're going to be reliable? Do you know why? because he uses them to prove it. It's a vicious circle. Reasoning can be called circular, although there are external agents that can verify reasoning, which is something precepts ignore. But the fact is, precepts label the reasoning of non-believers as vicious and that of believers as virtuous to make a special pleading that their reasoning is exempt from the circle because God gets them off the merry-go-round through an Im ambiguous Bible verse about God's authority. And of course, the verse does not instruct or explain, as in all the other ways God supposedly resolves philosophical problems. This is also an ad hominem with the vicious and virtuous labels, since synonyms for vicious are cruel and malicious, while virtuous is another word for good or righteous. On what basis do you, use, do you trust your sense and reasoning when you determine that they've been reliable? It's not a vicious circle. Um, 
if you want to know if a pin works, you pick it up and use it. Is it circular to pick it up and use it? If so, then I'll admit that this is circular. Is it, cir is it circular? Is it circular? Is it circular to use your reasoning to justify your reasoning? It's a practical necessity. Is it circular? I told you that at the I said in my uh, rebuttal here that it's a presupposition. Right. I'm not using reason to prove that reason is valid. I'm using reason because it continues to produce effective results. Do you use your reasoning in determining that? Yes. Well, then you're using your reasoning to prove your reasoning. Which isn't a problem <laughs> as long as it's continuing to produce effective okay. results. Okay, let, let me put it this way. A, oh, I'm sorry, it's your question. Let me put it this way. If your reasoning was not valid, how could you know it? I don't know. You don't know. See, that's the problem. You see, because he says he's using, he's using his reasoning to prove his reasoning. Well, if it wasn't valid, he could never know it. Well, I didn't say I couldn't ever know I'm it. I'm saying you couldn't know it. You said you don't oh, okay. know. I'm saying you couldn't know it. Good. Can because you, if your reasoning, if it wasn't valid, on what basis could you know that it, was, that it was valid? You couldn't. It would be invalid. How do you know your reasoning is not invalid, Matt? Well, see, reasoning isn't one thing, first of all. It's not like we just reason and it's all there. It's, it's, you, know, you might reason correctly at one instance, you might reason incorrectly at another instance, but that's me using reason, which is separate from reason, which is the foundations, the logical absolutes, which continue to be true. How do you know that your cognitive faculties by which you determine things to be true are functioning properly? Well, I test them by, comp by, by, using, them. by using them. Now, if they were not functioning properly, how could you know it? I'd probably be dead. <laughs> See, now, now that's a fallacy of irrelevant theses. A lot of people don't realize that. But the thing is, let's say I went to a plane crash. I was, I was a reporter hired to cover a plane crash. And I go to that plane crash and I say, how is it possible you survived this plane crash? And if he said, he said I, if, if I didn't survive it, I couldn't be here talking to you. That's exactly what Matt did here. I'm asking how he knows that his sense and reasoning are, are reliable. He says, well, I'd probably be dead. That's like me going to that plane crash and saying, how did you survive this crash? He said, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here talking with you. And it would be true. Uh -huh. It'd be true, but it'd be irrelevant, sir. It would be irrelevant. It's a fallacy of irrelevant thesis. Sure, he wouldn't be here. I agree with that, but I'm asking how he knows that they're valid. You can't know. You couldn't know if they were valid or not. What do you You're mean appealing? by no? I'm not saying that I know. I'm saying I believe them to be valid and that I believe that this belief is reasonable because of their continued But effectiveness. you could be wrong. I haven't claimed to know. But you could be wrong. I, I, have not, I have no reason to think that I'm wrong, but I cannot demonstrate that it's impossible that I'm wrong. That doesn't mean that I could be okay, wrong. Okay, how about this? Why don't you tell me one thing you know? Why? Because that's my question, sir. Well, what do you mean by no? Justified true belief. I'm not claiming to know. You'd anything. What, what, what do I consider as justified true belief? I, am, I believe that, uh, well, in that context, justified true belief, are we using my definition of true or yours? Yours. What do you know to be true? What do you sure, know that I know corresponds? I'm not omniscient in that context. Do you know that corresponds with absolute reality? Do you know that? No. Okay, well, that's fine. I asked him one thing, and he doesn't even know the one thing he claims to know. So this is something brand new. It seems that Sai has confronted this response from non-believers before and has since invented an answer. By claiming that knowing one is an omniscient, corresponds to absolute reality, he seems to think the non-believer is now unable to say it. Since precepts claim there are no absolutes outside God, he's merely putting a special pleading exemption on it. It's just like viciously and virtuously circular reasoning. reasoning. It's a label designed to remove objections and nothing else. I also believe that it contradicts his assertion that everyone knows for certain that as God exists because of general revelation. Yet they can't say they know they aren't omniscient. I guess I will next be trying to figure out another special pleading to weasel his way out of that one. What? What? That's the problem. That's a problem. I, you see, I don't mind. You know, I was the one who wanted a free exchange. <laughs> I did. I'll show you the emails. I mean, I'll post them later. I wanted a free exchange. Yeah, and you should she stop didn't, blaming and Sarah because I didn't. No, but she started it though. Yeah. And then you. <laughs> she did. Unless you, are, unless, you are preparing, unless you are preparing this debate, you know, uh, preparing the, 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 uh, the standard for this debate, you know, without my knowledge of it, that, that might have been the case behind the scenes. That's fine. I expect that. But, but that isn't the point. I mean, the fact is, I want to know how you can know anything to be true, and you have to dodge it. Like, the thing is, when I ask you how do you know something, if you don't answer that to anybody else, a cop comes up to you, you know, and, and they ask you how you know something, you don't say, what do you mean by no, officer? 
I mean, you only have to play these philosophical mumbo-jumbo games with a Christian <laughs> to avoid the God that all of you know exists. Sure, you can laugh if you want, but it's absurd. It's absurd. Okay, uh, let me ask you this question. If you remove right. every mind from the universe, yeah. a rock is still a rock. Yeah. You said if you remove every mind from the universe, a rock is still a rock. Yes. How do you know that? I didn't say that I knew it, did I? So what kind of a claim is it then? It's a belief claim. I am convinced that that's true and that it's reasonable. But you're saying a rock is still a rock. You're not saying you believe it. I'm expressing a belief. I don't recall using the word no, nor do I ever use it in your context of appealing to absolute reality, which is why I don't use the philosophical mumbo-jumbo with a cop, but I do with somebody who's going to try to say that anything is a claim to knowledge and anything is an appeal to an absolute reality when that is not what I'm appealing to at all. Okay, what is your evidence then that a rock is still a rock? The evidence that a rock is still a rock is that the rock is currently a rock. Yeah, right. right. Okay. But I'm saying you said... And, 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 that, and that there is no... There is no demonstrated effect of removing minds from the universe that would result in a rock ceasing to be what it is. It is consistent with the laws of logic that identity remains. The rock is a rock is a rock. That is the foundation. It's the, the logical absolutes are the presupposition that I agreed upon. That is the foundation upon which I determine what beliefs are justified and reasonable. So what is your evidence that a rock is a rock, even if there's no mind? What's your evidence of that? Because a rock is a rock now? There are minds now. What is your evidence that a rock will be a rock if there's no minds? I think I just told you. Well, you didn't. I mean, you could, uh, you could, you could reply. You could, uh... I, I, can, I could say it again in a different way if you'd like. Sure. What is your evidence that a we... rock is still a rock without any minds? The evidence is that there is no causal, there is no demonstrated connection that a rock would change what it is. It's like uh, the tree falling in the, in the forest type thing. Um, would, you, would you agree with me that uh, the rock that nobody has looked at on Fifth and, and Park uh, that's in the gutter is actually a rock even if nobody's looking at it? Well, it's my time to ask questions, but I want you to... In simple terms, you. argument from ignorance just means X is true because X has not been proved false. X seconds. is true because X has not been proved false. That's exactly what you said. Yes. About a rock being that's, not, that's an argument from ignorance. No, it's not. Right out of your mouth. It's not. Sure it is. Okay. You have 20, you have 20 seconds. Sorry. Here I've mentioned the primacy of existence and how Matt affirmed it while Psy denied it. Aside from the controversy over the primacy of existence because it is the crux of the philosophy of objectivism, I still believe it has valid, useful principles on metaphysics or existence. This is a quick description of how it works. Reality is absolute and is independent of consciousness. Consciousness is defined as the act of perceiving or identifying that which exists. Therefore, existence has primacy over consciousness because one's consciousness could not be aware without it. And because existence is primary, existence cannot by default be the product of consciousness, which is what size God claims are all about, that a consciousness called as God created everything that exists, while Matt affirms the absoluteness of reality. Of course, if you read objectivist Dawson Bethrick's website, Incinerating Presuppositionalism, you will find Dawson has done numerous debates with precepts, particular, particularly Dustin Seeger's. The precepts vigorously deny primacy of consciousness with special pleadings for the definition of their God's existence, that God is exempt because he is eternally existent or self-existent because it's the only way they think they can trump the primacy of existence. In other words, the primacy of existence cannot be overcome. Oh, no, that's fine. Next up is Matt's questions to Sai, and thanks for watching. <laughs>